high. Um, what I'm attempting to do here is to pipette some of this reagent into this test tube. Uh, chemists are very good at this. I'm not much of a chemist, I'll tell you, but I try. There we are. Of course, I use this graduated pipette to guarantee that I put the proper volume of the reagent into the test tube. Of course, I could be a bit more arbitrary and, in a sense, increase the variance of my procedure, my experimental procedure, by using a dropper and just trying to get it in there by counting the proper number of drops. And one for good measure. There we go. Of course, in repeated operations, using the eyedropper, I would have intentionally inflated the variability intrinsic to the data-taking process as compared to that um, uh, graduated pipette. Of course, I could go the whole hog here and just use my chemist's eye and, you know, just plonk in the right amount of material. Like that. The equivalent of the butcher's thumb. And of course, if I were to repeat uh, this measuring process over and over again, it should be clear to all of you that the variability which is intrinsic to that measuring process is very large relative to that involved using the uh, dropper or, once again, larger still than that involved using the graduated pipette. Of course, we're interested in taking our measurements with the smallest possible variability. And some of the variability is invariably uh, contributed by the measuring instruments. And you can buy more expensive measuring instruments and decrease the intrinsic variability. Don't make the following mistake, though, in thinking about the variance and so forth. The principal sources of variability which impinge on an experimental environment are generally not those contributed by the measuring instruments. We usually think of measuring instruments right away. And frankly, those are usually in pretty good shape. But the real source of variability aren't necessarily uh, those spawned by the measuring devices. And of course, part of the idea of taking this course is to find out how we can get rid of some of these sources of variability or block them away uh, from intruding on our data measuring procedures. Well, if we took a lot of observations, of course, the observations have a distribution, and we'd characterize the distribution in terms of the mean and the variance and the higher moments. What statistic do we use to estimate the mean of the distribution of the observations, regardless of the shape of the distribution? Uh, we use the average to estimate the mean. And what's nice about averages? Well, averages are statistics which are constructed from the observations that tend to have a normal distribution. And you'll recall that as we declared many times, the reference distribution for averages is a normal distribution with a mean eta and a variance sigma squared over n. That's the mean of the distribution of the observations. Sigma squared is the variance of the observations. And of course, n is the number of observations getting into the average. We say the averages tend to have a normal distribution with mean eta and variance sigma squared over n. And then once we pick up that normal distribution, due to the central limit theorem, we then come back and we're ready to talk in terms of the normal deviate. And we've all been exposed to the fact that the normal deviate can be obtained by taking the average minus the mean, the, statist the parameter, the statistic estimates, and dividing it down by the square root of the variance of that statistic. The variance of an average is sigma squared over n. So much for averages. And what about the variance again? Well, the variance, you remember, is the second moment of the distribution corrected for the mean. And we've defined sigma squared, the variance, to be the second moment corrected for the mean. So you take the observations, subtract the mean, square those little deviations up, multiply by their frequencies, and sum them over the region for which the uh, observations are, in fact, defined. So much for the variance of the observations, but gang, what about the variance of the statistics that we construct from the observations? Now, the average is only one of a whole host of statistics we could manufacture out of the observations. It's a statistic of a certain class. It's called a linear combination of the observations. So I'd like to show you a linear combination of the observations and show you that the average is such a statistic. But to do this requires just a wee bit of algebra. Don't panic. It's not that difficult. And um, let's see a linear combination of the observations right away. Consider five observations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first observation and multiply it by some coefficient, or rather called A1, a constant of some kind. Then I'm going to take the second observation and multiply it by a constant, its own constant. All the way down the deck, take the last observation and multiply it by a constant. And then I'm going to sum the whole group up, and I will have constructed what is called a linear statistic. OK, let's look at a linear statistic. Here's one right here. There are the five observations, y1, y2, y3, y4, y5, and each one is multiplied by its own coefficient. Those are the a's, a1, a2, all the way down to a5. 
and then you sum them up. And thus you have constructed a linear statistic. Here it is algebraically. The sum of the AIs, YIs, gives you a linear combination of the observations or a statistic. Okay, gang. Now let's look at the average. You've probably never thought of the average in all this detail, but by golly, the average is a linear statistic because each one of the observations happens to be multiplied by 1 over n. In this case, n is 5 because there are 5 observations. So you can see quickly that the average is a linear combination of the observations. Suppose I ask you to think in terms of the following statistic. Um, the difference between the third and fourth observation, okay? Think of the difference between the third and fourth observations and then review it as a linear statistic, see? The first, the second, and last observations are preceded by zeros, and there's a plus one in front of y3 and a minus one in front of y4. So by golly, the difference is a linear statistic. Here's a, a popular statistic. You most of you don't think of the total of the observations as a statistic, but it is. Each observation is pre-multiplied by a one, and they're all summed up to give the total. Here's a very interesting statistic. Suppose in the first three observations had been taken under process A, and the last two observations have been taken under process B, and you were out to look at the difference between the two averages. And so what would have happened in that case is the first three observations would have had a coefficient one-third, see, to give you the average in Y bar A, and then the last two observations would have had the coefficient minus a half because you want to subtract the average of the last uh, two observations. And so there's a linear statistic which happens to be the difference between two averages. Okay, now for the $64 question. Uh, what is the variance of a uh, linear statistic? If I have a linear statistic, a linear combination of the observations, what's its variance? And I have a little answer box up here. This isn't supposed to be black magic, but uh, I do happen to have the answers in my answer box. The variance of a statistic is always some constant uh, times sigma squared. Sigma squared is the variance of the observations. Okay, what's the variance of a linear combination of the observations? The variance of a linear combination of the observations, given that the errors are independent of one another, is the sum of the AI squares. In other words, take the coefficients, square them, and sum them up. All right? Now, watch it work. Let's go back and get the uh, average. That's a linear statistic we were playing with a little while ago. And let's get the variance of the average. It says take the coefficients, square them, and sum them up. Well, each coefficient's one-fifth. You square the one-fifth, you get one-twenty-fifth, and then there are five one-twenty-fifths. And so the variance of this average happens to be one-fifth sigma squared, see that? How about the uh, variance of a difference, gang? Would someone like to uh, hazard a guess as to what the variance of this particular statistic is? Don't say zero sigma squared. <laughs> the variance of the difference is two sigma squared because the first coefficient is a plus one, another coefficient is a minus one, all the other coefficients are zero. If you take the sum of squares of those coefficients, you'll come out equal to two. So the variance of a difference between two observations is equal to two sigma squared. Well now, let's try another one. Who'd like to guess what the variance of a total is? And everybody quickly courses back five sigma squared. Why is it five sigma squared? Because each coefficient of the observations is one and you just count the sum of squares of those ones. And now finally, how about that more complicated statistic we had, the difference between those two averages? The average of the first three observations minus the average of the last two observations. Well, what would be the variance of that statistic, gang? One-ninth plus one-ninth plus one-ninth plus one-fourth plus one-fourth. Or if you like, one-third, one-ninth, three of them, one-third plus one-half, the one-fourth, two of them. One-third plus one-half sigma squared, or if you will, five-six sigma squared. So the variance of a statistic, which is a linear combination of the observations, is given by what? Very simple formula, very simple equation. You have a linear statistic. The variance of that statistic is some constant times sigma squared, and the constant is summation ai squared. That's pretty simple. Now, it's important for the following reason. We're trying to put ourselves in a position where we can generalize some of the things we've learned. And I'll let you in on a secret. You know, the central limit theorem sort of carries over relative to statistics that are linear combinations of the observations, and we can find out that uh, the normal deviate actually can be expressed in more general terms for a wider class of statistics. And so let's look at that. Here's the normal deviate written down in words. The normal deviate, z, is always equal to a statistic minus the parameter the statistic estimates 
divided down by the square root or the variance of the statistic. Now this statistic has to be of a certain class. It has to be what we call a linear combination of the observations. And so you see here the same blooming expression written out algebraically. The statistic is a linear combination of the observations minus. Now this is read the following. The expected value of the statistic. That's a fancy terminology which means the parameter the statistic is estimating, okay? So there's the statistic minus the parameter estimates divided down by the square root of the variance of the statistic, some constant times sigma squared and the constants of some of the AI squares. And you're already acquainted with one linear statistic, aren't you? The average. And you'll all recall the old formula for the average. When it's plugged into the equation of the normal deviate, z is equal to y bar, the statistic, see? Minus eta, the thing the statistic estimates, divided down by the square root of the variance of the statistic, some constant times sigma squared, and the constant is 1 over n. Okay? Very good. Well, what do you say we try to fix all this in terms of a, uh, a problem, get some data, and we'll all feel more comfortable? So I want you to, uh, oh, I don't know, contemplate some data with which you're all uh, reasonably familiar. Oh, let's see now. 36. 24, 36. Uh, let's say the uh, young lady is uh, 26 years old and her birthday's on the 28th. <laughs> no, 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 that's not right at all. First of all, the observations all have to be measured in terms of the same units. And of course, the observations do, in fact, equal the thing we're attempting to measure, the true parameter eta, uh, plus a disturbance epsilon. And in this case, the thing we are attempting to measure was the amount of charge remaining on the battery of that golf car at the completion of 36 screens of golf. And so it was a rather um, strenuous exercise. We had to go around the golf course twice to get a single observation. And um, what we would do in this instance to get the uh, observation, we would just stop uh, at the end of two rounds of golf and uh, take out a hydrometer and measure the charge in the batteries. And then by use of some simple algebra, we could determine what the percent charge remaining in the uh, batteries uh, happened to be. And uh, in this fashion, we uh, garnered those uh, five observations. Now, those five observations, again, were um, 36, 24, 36, 26, and 28. The thing we're measuring is eta, the percent charge remaining after the completion of 36 screens of golf, and we recognize our observations suffer from error. Each observation equals the true response plus a disturbance. The average of all these uh, results was uh, y bar was equal to, um, let's see, what is the average of all those blooming things? 30, and the uh, variance, um, we determine on the basis of lots of prior knowledge relative to taking such measurements, the variance of these observations is equal to 20. And now we have the uh, following situation. We have a problem in which um, the engineers dealing with the batteries in these golf cars uh, realize that the mean performance of the batteries up to this point in time had, be to had been to leave 28% of the charge uh, in the batteries after the completion of the 36 greens. And they had tried some new plate configurations in an effort to extend uh, this amount, uh, this, this amount of charge remaining. And so we had gone out and taken these data. Now we have uh, five observations entering an average, giving us an average of 30. 